A while ago, I made a video explaining the Windows iceberg, but because I am an average operating system enjoyer, this time I bring you the Linux iceberg explained. Before we begin, I invite you to subscribe and leave a comment if you liked the video. I always hoard comments. Hello world, but severe. If you're new to the channel, I make videos about tech, software and everything in between. I made this iceberg by myself and with the help of some pretty cool reddit users over at r slash linux master race that gave me some ideas to include them in this video. You'll have the original thread in the description below just in case that you want to check it out. The iceberg has 5 tiers, each one containing 10 topics, so in total we have 50 topics. This video is going to be a long one, so let's begin. Tier 1 Linux It is a monolithic kernel written by Linus Torvalds. Its main characteristic is that it is licensed under the GPL license that makes it free and open source. This means that everyone can contribute to the development or even make its own modified versions of it. In 1991, Linus started working on the kernel as a hobby when he was attending the University of Helsinki with the goal of creating a system like Minix, that is a Unix operating system. That is why Linux shares a lot of similarities with Unix and it is considered a Unix-like system. The name Linux was adopted from its creator's first name, just replacing the S with an X. At the time of this recording, the latest stable version of the kernel is 5.17. Distributions A Linux distribution is an operating system that uses the Linux kernel. There are about 500 active Linux distributions. Right now you are seeing the Linux distribution timeline that shows all of the Linux distros when they were made and what they are based on. The main Linux distros or Debian, Slackware, Ubuntu, Red Hat or Fedora, Arch Linux and Gentoo. Usually there are distributions for every use case. For example, Arch Linux and Gentoo are for very advanced users. Linux Mint welcomes beginners and Ubuntu Touch is a specialized for mobile devices. Desktop Environments A desktop environment is a graphical user interface that comes with some software pre-installed that is useful for the user, like a desk manager, a calculator or a settings app. Every desktop environment has a different amount of customization and they follow their own guidelines. The most popular desktop environments are GNOME, KDE Plasma and XFCE. Some distros tend to customize the desktop environments to a certain degree to match with their aesthetic. Like the modifications that Ubuntu or Pop! OS make to GNOME like adding a dock. Some distros even make forks of other desktop environments. This is the case of Cinnamon and Mate. Package Manager a package manager is a software that takes care of installing, removing, and updating your packages. A package is a collection of files that usually are for a program. For example, Debian and Ubuntu-based distros use apt, the advanced package tool. Fedora uses DNF, that stands for Dendify Gem, and Arch Linux uses Pacman. Yes, like the game character. Steam Deck. The Steam Deck is a handheld gaming PC developed by Valve and AMD, released on February 25th of 2022. This device runs SteamOS 3.0, that is a Linux distribution made by Valve based on Arch Linux. This console runs native Linux games, of course, but it also uses the Proton compatibility layer to be able to run a lot of Windows games. And because Windows has a big catalog and also considering that you can set up console emulators, it makes the Steam Deck look like a very promising device. Some people, including me, have the hope that it will increase the Linux market share enough for developers to start caring about it. Linus Torvalds Linus Torvalds is the creator and main developer of Linux. He was born on December 28, 1969, being today 52 years old. 
Some people don't know that he also was the creator of GET, that stands for Global Information Tracker, and it is an open source version control system that it is used for a lot of big software projects. Most developers use it. Linus is also known in the Linux community for disliking a lot the company NVIDIA due to the difficulty of working with them and the mediocre support that they offered to the system. He even showed the middle finger to them publicly and said the F word. Tux Tux is Linux's mascot. It is a penguin with a slight smile. It gets that name because penguins look like they're wearing a tuxedo, and Tux is a nickname for that. I mean, I guess that you can see the similarity. Also, James Huge said that this name stood for Torvalds Unix. In 1996, Linus Torvalds saw this exact image on an FPT server, and he liked it so much that it ended up being the inspiration for Tux. Eventually, Larry Ewing submitted what would be the final Linux mascot design to a Linux logo contest. To design it, he used the first version of GIMP. Interestingly, Tux is not the logo of Linux, but the mascot. This is because Tux did not win any of the logo competitions, but pretty much everyone nowadays relates a penguin with Linux. There are multiple variations of the design. Here you are seeing a couple of them. But to be honest, my favorite one is the original design. The penguin was actually not the first proposed design. Alan Mackey made this concept for an alternate mascot being this fox. Something pretty cool that I found while researching about this was that to raise money for a charity to help people that had been affected by a flood in Australia, Queensland, a flight took place and brought a tax plush to the space. Of course, you have the complete video in the description. Distro Watch and Distro Chooser Distrowatch.com is a website that ranks Linux and BSD distributions depending on how much people use them, based on how many times the download button is clicked on the official distro's website. Most people use it to see how popular a distro is. Distrochooser.de is another website whose purpose is to guide new users and help them to choose a Linux distro that suits their needs. It asks you some questions to know your preferences like the use case or if you prefer a Windows or Mac interface. I recommend you to go and visit it if you're planning on installing a distro, but if you don't know exactly which one. Richard Stallman Richard Matthew Stallman is an American computer programmer that was born on March 16, 1953 in New York. He is the founder of the non-profit organization Free Software Foundation that promotes free and open source software. The goal can be summarized in one phrase. The users should have the freedom to run, edit, contribute to and share the software. Stallman also worked on the GNU project, same one that we're going to talk about in a minute. Lately, he has been a very controversial person because in 2019, he made some comments about a victim of that millionaire whose last name is similar to Einstein. You know who I am referring to. Later that month, he resigned from the MIT and the Free Software Foundation, but in 2021, he returned to the board of directors. This was met with a lot of discussion again as a letter was published on GitHub asking for the removal of Richard Stallman from the Free Software Foundation, backed by organizations like GNOME and Mozilla, but they have not achieved what they wanted. GNU The GNU project started by Richard Stallman in 1983 because he wanted to create a free open source operating system alternative to Unix. GNU stands for GNU's Not Unix, making it a recursive acronym. It is a collection of 459 free and open source software packages essential for an operating system to work. Some components of GNU are the GNU compiler collection, the GNU C library, the GNU debugger, the GNU core utilities, and the GNU bash shell. 
One of the most important contributions of the GNU project is the GPL license, that stands for GNU General Public License. This allows software to be registered under a completely free license that forces everyone that modifies the project to also make its modifications open source. The GNU project was originally developing its own microkernel, called GNU Hurt, but sadly after 32 years it is still not ready due to a high amount of bugs and missing features. Now remember that Linux is essentially just the kernel, so it needs some software like GNU to be a fully working operating system. And because of the poor state of GNU Hurt, basically everyone that wanted a free system started to use Linux with GNU, because it was a working free kernel. And that's how we get what you've probably heard, GNU slash Linux. Tier 2 Linux Market Share According to StatCounter, a website that takes care of registering web analytics, Linux has a desktop market share of 2.2%, and if you count Chrome OS as a Linux distro, then its 2.8% summed up gives us a total market share of about 5%. If we compare them to the 75% and 15% that Windows and Mac OS represent, it is very little. However, things change when we take a look at the mobile OS with most market share, and that is Android, with 70% of the devices running it. And Linux and other Unix-like systems represent the 77-80% to 80 of the public server's market share. So basically, Linux runs on most devices but desktop computers. Chrome OS Chrome OS is a proprietary operating system that uses the Linux kernel, and it is focused on being simple, easy to use, and lightweight. It achieves the last thing mentioned because basically, Chrome OS is Chrome on top of the Gentoo Linux distro, and the apps are just progressive web apps. Over time, this OS has gotten more complete, with the ability to run Android apps with Google Play services very well, and even Linux apps, making it a rather interesting option for beginners or for people with a low-end computer. Similar to Android, this project is based on a more bare-bones, open-source version of it, called Chromium OS. Chrome OS is exclusive for Chromebooks, but recently a new version came out called Chrome OS Flux, that makes you able to install it on any supported computer. I was actually making a video about the installation and everything, and it got cancelled because it was such a pain to get it to work, starting with the flashing tool that Google provides that always fails and won't work on Linux, and the OS is still in very early stages, rebooting every 5 minutes. Shell a shell is a program that includes a command line interface, making you able to execute commands and programs. Bash is the GNU project's shell, standing for Born Again Shell. Most Unix-like OSs use it by default, like macOS, Linux, and FreeBSD. There are other alternative shells that try to fit the necessities of other users like the fish shell, that features auto-suggestions based on history, or the C shell that also has improvements over Bash. I use Arch, by the way. This is a very popular phrase in the Linux community, so much that it has become a meme. Arch Linux is a distribution that came out in 2002, and that is known for being mainly for advanced users, because you have to set up everything yourself. In 2011, the Twitter user XYLit0L <laughs> published this meme of a guy asking a girl if she knows that he uses Arch Linux, being one of the first mentions found about this meme. 
but the first one that actually used the phrase itself is believed to be this one, a post on r slash Linux Master Race in 2017, using the mocking SpongeBob format, making fun of users that comment the catchphrase. Nowadays, it is basically just used ironically, and people have modified it to mention the distro that they use. For example, I use Fedora, by the way. I'd like to interject for a moment. This is another phrase that became a meme and it is used as a copy pasta. People use it as a satirical reply to people who call GNU slash Linux just Linux. I actually could not find the exact origin of the phrase and in the install again to wiki it says that it is actually a fictional phrase attributed to Richard Stallman, but I've seen some people on Reddit saying that it was from a real conference where he actually interjected. <laughs> To this copypasta, a user frequently replies with another one also believed to be fictional that contradicts the first one. I was planning to read the whole copypasta, but I suspect that this video is already getting long enough, so you'll have to conform yourselves with just a screenshot. False System Hierarchy Standard the file system hierarchy standard or FHS is a convention for how a Unix-like system is structured. It all starts with the root directory that is the parent of all the other directories. I am going to tell you a little bit about what the main folders are for. Slash bin has essential command binaries like cat or ls. Slash boot contains all the bootloader files. In a slash dub, you find all your connected devices. This is why you might have heard the phrase that everything is a file, because devices and other stuff that you wouldn't have thought about are actually files. Slash etc stands for etc and you usually find system-wide config files in here. Slash home is the user's home directory, where they store documents, downloads and that stuff. Slash lib is where the libraries for programs are stored. Slash media is the default mount point for removable drives like a USB or a CD. A slash mnt is a directory where you usually would manually install your drives. A slash opt is where you store the optional applications packages. A slash sbin saves all the essential system binaries. A slash proc stores all the processes that are actually files because, again, everything is a file. A slash root is the root user's home directory. A slash tmp stores all the temporary files, like when you create a new unsaved document. A slash usr contains the majority of multi user utilities and applications. A slash bar has all the files that are expected to change at runtime, like logs. Raspberry Pi A Raspberry Pi is a very small and cheap computer that runs Linux, usually a Raspberry OS, previously called Raspbian. It is used for a wide variety of projects because you can program it and modify it. People have created handheld gaming consoles with these or have even set up a Minecraft server. There are several models of Raspberry Pis, but the cheapest one is the Raspberry Pi Zero version 1 that costs about $5. Run Windows Software on Linux there are three main ways of running Windows software on Linux or alongside with it. The first one is Wine. Wine stands for Wine is not an emulator, and it is a compatibility layer that allows you to run Windows apps on POSIX compliant systems like macOS, Linux, and BSD. Wine translates the Windows API calls into POSIX calls at runtime, which gets rid of all the performance decrease that you would get for running, for example, a virtual machine. Other technologies like Proton are based on Wine, and tools like Bottles make it very easy to use this technology. The downside is that because Windows is closed source, developers are basically trying to mimic how it works without knowing exactly how it works. This makes Wine not a very perfect compatibility layer, so you could have some issues with it, and software like drivers will not work with it. 
I'd say that for basic stuff, it is impressive how good it is, and I haven't had any issue with it. But maybe for some more complex stuff, it won't work properly. The second way of running Windows apps on Linux is with a virtual machine with Kimu, KVM, and GPU pass-through. As I've told you, running a virtual machine makes the performance worse. But if you figure out how to make a virtual machine with GPU pass-through, this VM will directly communicate with your GPU. Making graphics-related tasks like gaming almost as good as if you were running the software directly on your machine. Unfortunately for now, enabling this is not so easy for the average user, as you'll have to run some scripts, some commands and change configuration files, but it is the definitive answer for running basically every Windows program that you want on Linux. Another not so usual downside is that specific programs like the ones a school would give you to prevent you from cheating on a test will try to detect if you're on a virtual machine. So that is another thing you'll have to deal with. And the last way to run Windows software is to not run it on Linux directly, but alongside with it. More specifically, to have a Linux partition with all your usual stuff and a Windows partition with all the Windows exclusive software. When you boot up your computer, Grub will let you choose what OS it should boot. This is called dual booting, and it is very easy to do, as beginner-friendly distros will help you to do it when you're installing them. But be careful, because I've heard a lot that if you install Linux and Windows on the same drive, when Windows updates, it will detect your Linux partition and will format it along with Grub. I wonder if Microsoft does this on purpose. The solution is to install them on different drives. NeoFetch NeoFetch is a command line interface program made by the user Dylan Everapps, registered under the MIT license. That when executed, tells you a summary of information about your system, like what distribution you're running, on what hardware, and how many packages you have installed. To be honest, the main thing that people use it for is to brag after installing Arch or any hard distro, or actually to brag about any distro that you're using in general. TTY TTY stands for Teletype Grider, and it is an abstract device in Unix-like systems at the kernel level that presents you with a command line prompt where you can execute commands. There are six TTYs and you can access one by pressing Ctrl plus Alt plus F3. Usually a TTY is used for troubleshooting or when your graphical user interface is not available. Tier 3 do as I say, by Linus. On November 9th, 2021, one of the most popular YouTube tech channels, Linus Tech Tips, started a series of videos where Linus and Luke, from Linus Media Group, challenge each other to leave Windows behind and to switch to Linux for one month. Linus, being an advanced Windows user and knowing not a lot about Linux, faced some issues throughout the whole series, but the one that became a meme was when he was trying to install Steam on Linux, more specifically on Pop OS, by using the Pop Shop, a program where you get your software from different repositories. It is known that the Pop Shop can be very buggy sometimes, and this happened at the worst moment, because when Linus installed Steam, he was presented with an error being forced to install it via the terminal. This is when for some reason when executing the command sudo apt-get install steam, it intends to delete the whole desktop environment, asking for confirmation with the phrase yes, do as I say. Linus, very confused, typed that thing, nuking his entire OS forcing him to try out another distro that did not have these issues. Windows Subsystem for Linux WSL is short for, well, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and it is basically a program that you install from the Microsoft Store on Windows 10 or 11 that allows you to choose from a wide variety of distros like Ubuntu or Kali Linux and run Linux apps on Windows 
creating a whole subsystem with its respective files inside Windows. At first, it only ran command line interface apps like Nano or some scripts, but with the release of the Windows subsystem for Linux 2, it got the ability to also run GUI apps. This is useful mainly for developers, and an average user may not even know about this, but some people claim that this is Microsoft trying to kill the Linux desktop, using the very known technique of embrace, extend, and extinguish that Microsoft has used with Netscape, for example. I don't really know what to think about this last theory, but as far as I know, the Linux compatibility is not really perfect and has limitations. Thailand Window Managers A window manager is a system software that takes care of controlling the placement and appearance of your windows in your graphical user interface. With this in mind, a Thailand Window Manager is a window manager that tries to take advantage of all your screen real estate by opening programs in different sizes. For example, if you open a first window, it will appear maximized, but if you open a second window, the first one will take half of the screen, same as the second one, and so on. The downside is that you cannot take a window freely and move it wherever you want. In case that you need to do something like this, you are better off using a floating window manager that does allow this type of behavior, so it is not a surprise that only advanced users tend to use them. A good amount of people prefer tiling window managers instead of using full desktop environments creating a debate of which one is better. The most popular tiling window managers are i3, DWM, OSM, or Sway. X11 and Wayland, Pulse Audio and Pipe Wire. X11 or Xorg is a windowing system created way back in 1987. It is the default display protocol for most distros. The way that it works is that the programs communicate with the X11 server before the compositor can generate the window that is needed for the application to render properly. It is reliable but very slow by modern standards. Wayland is another display protocol whose goal is to replace X11. The way it works is by using client-side rendering, allowing the programs to communicate directly with the compositor that it wishes to render a window for. This makes Wayland faster than Xorg, but there are some problems currently, like screen recording, that needs pipe wire to work properly because in Wayland, windows are encapsulated and some programs rely heavily on X11. About Pulse Audio, it is a sound server for POSIX operating systems. This one is also the default for most distros and in most use cases it works just fine. Even though I've heard that some people have had problems with it, by default it is configured to automatically detect all sound cards and manage them taking control of all the detected ALSA devices and rendering all audio streams to itself, making it the central configuration point. But for low latency tasks like audio production, it is necessary to use a professional sound server API called Jack. PipeWire is a new server that handles not only audio but also video. It features some advantages over Pulse Audio, delivering a better security model that allows isolation between applications and secure access from within containers. It is also able to accommodate the professional use case, being able to replace Jack due to its low latency. I mentioned these technologies together because they seem to be in a similar state. New tech trying to replace old tech, but they're not 100% there for all people. Even though distros like Fedora already include Wayland and Pipewire by default, so it is just a matter of time until all distros start using them. Destructive commands. In Linux, the terminal is a very useful, powerful, and dangerous tool if you do not know how to use it. Trolls on the internet usually share destructive commands to new users and they end up destroying their systems. Today, I'm just going to show you three of them. Let's begin with this thing. 
Yeah, I know, it looks like a lot of gibberish, but you're actually declaring a function that inside of it calls itself and sends that output again to itself. This last thing runs in the background. The last character calls that function, creating a loop that'll end up wasting all your resources and freezing up your computer, forcing you to restore it. This other command clears all the partitions that you have on your SDA drive, where you usually have the operating system installed. And this last one is the most popular one, sudo rm-rf slash. It deletes your root directory. There are also some variations, like the one adding a star at the end, that will delete everything on the root, and because of the Unix-like file system, this will delete all your data and all your connected drives. Linux phones this one refers to the fact that basically Android is a type of Linux because it uses the kernel, so Android phones are Linux phones. But a lot of people don't agree, and this is where real Linux phones come in. We're talking about phones that run an actual Linux distribution that is usually adapted to a mobile interface like Kitty Plasma Mobile or Fosh. Example of these phones are the Pine Phone and the Live 5, devices that sadly really haven't had a lot of success compared to Android or iOS, so the market for them is still very small. With projects like Mbox or Wajoid, that allow these phones to run Android apps, there is the hope that maybe they will eventually succeed, but we'll have to wait. The year of the Linux desktop. This is another phrase that became a meme in the community. You see, Linux in the desktop market hasn't really had a lot of success, but there's people that hope that when it reaches a good amount of users, or that when it is suitable for most needs, that is when the year of the Linux desktop will be. Some claim that it was in the 90s, others claim that in 2004, others that it was the year when you installed Linux, but still, most believe that it hasn't happened yet. Windows Refund Day On February 15th, 1999, it was the Windows Refund Day, where mainly Linux users went to Microsoft's offices to return their unused licenses of Windows that they were forced to get because they were bundled with the computer that they had bought. This may sound funny, but actually in the end user license agreement for Windows, it states clearly that if the user refuses the agreement, Windows can be returned to the manufacturer and they would get a refund. This was theoretically of course, and because almost nobody asked for a refund for Windows, manufacturers would usually refuse to make a refund because they would lose money. At the end of the day, these users were not able to get their refunds, but it was a pretty interesting day. Michael MJD has a very good video about this, and I'll leave it in the comments in case that you want to watch it. Minnesota University Ban In April 2021, two researchers from the University of Minnesota decided to submit buggy patches of the Linux kernel to study what would happen. They even released a paper explaining what they did and what was their goal. When the community found out, they removed the contributions that they submitted, and the whole University of Minnesota was banned from contributing to the kernel. It was a very controversial thing when it was found, but to be honest, I do not know what they were expecting. <laughs> Libre Booting Libre Boot is an open source boot firmware founded in December of 2013 that initializes the hardware and stores a bootloader for your operating system. One of its goals is to replace the proprietary BIOS or UFI firmwares that your computer most likely has. It is a distribution of core boot, but with all the proprietary binary blobs removed from it. It currently supports 32 and 64 bit systems and the ARM architecture. Tier 4 Linux is free if you don't follow your time. There is an old saying Linux is free if you don't value your time. 
Basically, this refers that while Linux is free, you might have to pay by spending a good amount of time learning how the system works, getting used to it, or researching how to fix some problem or how to get a program that you need working on Linux. So you would be better off by just paying to get Windows or Mac OS to avoid wasting your time. In 2018, the YouTube channel TechLead uploaded a controversial video where he says why he thinks that the phrase is right, and that basically due to poor software compatibility and other reasons, Linux can be a waste of time. This video didn't really get a lot of positive feedback, and other YouTubers like Mental Outlaw replied to him contradicting what he said. Exiting Vim Vim is an open-source terminal-based text editor that is highly configurable and has some powerful features. However, one of the most common complaints is that Vim has some very weird shortcuts and that a lot of beginners don't really know how to exit Vim. This has become a meme not only among Linux users but also programmers in general. To exit Vim, you have to exit the edit mode and enter the command mode by pressing the ESC key, then type a colon and Q to quit the editor. Ubuntu and Amazon in 2021, when Ubuntu was using its own desktop environment called Unity, Canonical added a new feature that made it so that when you opened the dash menu and typed something, you would get your usual results but also web results from Amazon, and its web apps were also included by default. This was a very criticized decision because it sent your keystrokes to Amazon, so much that even Richard Stallman said that Ubuntu was now spyware. Eventually, they removed that feature, but the web apps were still present until 2020, when the Amazon shortcut that was present in the dash was removed. Linux is obsolete. This refers to the grim debate that Andrew Stewart Tannenbaum, the creator of Minix, and Linus Torvalds had in 1992, with Tannenbaum claiming that Linux was obsolete because it is a monolithic kernel, and that microkernels like the one Minix has are far superior because they offer better portability, that means that they are easier to port to other architectures. The debate with each reply became more complex and a little more intense, with some people thinking it was a flame war. Linus sent an email to apologize, but the debate is still alive to this day. You can read all the replies in the link in the description below. Linux on Mars on February 19, 2021, NASA landed a rover called Perseverance on Mars after surviving a 7-minute plunge through the Martian atmosphere because there was a delay of 11 minutes between Earth and Mars, so it had to deal with it with a set of pre-programmed instructions. Along with Perseverance, there was another invention, the Ingenuity Mars helicopter, whose objective was to become the first powered flight on any other planet than Earth, and it runs Linux, so now you can say that Linux made it to Mars. Device of Community if you've been present in the Linux community, you might know that it can be a little bit divisive. A lot of people are always arguing what distro, desktop environment, package manager, or text editor is the best. Some of them think that it makes them superior or something, but unironically. Some examples of this are Linux Mint vs Ubuntu, GNOME vs KDE Plasma, or desktop environments vs Thailand Window Managers in general, Pacman vs Apt, and Veeam vs Emacs. Linux Later and Linux, to run Windows apps, we have Wine, but systems like FreeBSD also have their own compatibility layer. In this case, they have one called Linux Later, to specifically run Linux programs. It does not involve emulation nor virtual machines. This is mainly useful to run programs like Steam that don't have a version for FreeBSD, but do have one for Linux. Windows kernel replaced with Linux. 
In 2020, Eric Raymond published an article where he says why he thinks that Windows will eventually replace its anti-kernel with the Linux kernel, running all the Windows programs with a compatibility layer like Wine. As hints that this was going to happen, he says that the Microsoft Edge port to Linux is one of them and also the Windows subsystem for Linux. This became news rapidly and a lot of people were actually starting to believe that Microsoft was going to replace the kernel. Some clickbaity articles didn't help at all. The original article is very optimistic, but there are a lot of issues if this was going to be done, because software like drivers are made specifically for the anti-kernel and wouldn't really work on Linux, so I do not think that it is going to happen at all. System D hate. System D is a suite of basic software for Linux systems developed by Red Hat. Among the main things it provides, we can find an init system and a service manager. Some people tend to really dislike System D because it is not just a replacement for the old init system, but it is more than that. As I've said, it is a suite of software, so it tries to change how everything is essentially organized. This is the main argument why people dislike it, because it tries to do a lot of things going against the Unix philosophy that it states to do one thing and do it very well. Some other people say that it is bloated and that is why they dislike it. Ubuntu causes girl to drop out of college. In 2009, a girl from McFarland named Abby bought an $1100 laptop from Dell to take online classes in MATC. The issue comes when she found out that it didn't run Windows, it ran Ubuntu. So when she tried to load the exe file from her Verizon CD to get Wi-Fi drivers, I suppose, it wouldn't load. Of course, because these kind of files don't run on Linux, they're for Windows. So she wasn't able to connect to the internet to take her online classes, forcing her to temporarily drop out of college. She also found out that the laptop didn't have Microsoft Office, but instead OpenOffice. That's why she called 27 News that reported the whole incident and called Verizon that told them that they would send a tech support crew to her house to fix it. This went viral and they even followed it up with a second part where they say that they got a lot of phone calls and messages from toxic Linux users that were insulting 27 News and Abby, with some saying that she was lazy and that this proved that she was not ready to go to college. She started getting her on Facebook and things got out of hand. The reporter even went to visit a technology consultant that showed him how Ubuntu worked and all that stuff. It is a little bit funny how the reporters react to this story because they try to paint Ubuntu as some sort of bootleg operating system and hassle. Fortunately, some people also offered to help her, so at least there is that. I mean, I think that it really wasn't the girl's fault because, believe it or not, this is how the average user would react, and I think that these toxic Linux fans shouldn't have her her, but I don't know, let me know your opinion in the comments. Tier 5 Linux from Scratch Linux from Scratch is a project that guides you with instructions to build your Linux system from source code. It is considered one of the hardest things a Linux user can do, even harder than a watch Linux, because you have to build all the components by yourself. It is only recommended for advanced users to try this. Audacity is spyware. In 2021, a lot of open source news sites started to call Audacity a spyware because the new owner, Muse Group, was changing the privacy policy and implementing some telemetry features. Other news outlets have come out and they say that Audacity is not actually a spyware and that it was all a misunderstanding. The only data that it collects is the operating system name and version. 
the user country determined by the IP address, the CPU, error codes, and crash reports to improve the program, but the damage was already done, and some people still have some reasons to believe that Audacity is spyware. Personally, I still use it. I'm actually recording this video's audio with it. Linja's Torobaltos is your son a computer hacker? This is a satirical article from 2001, where a parent discovers that his son uses an operating system called Linux, a hacker operating system made by a Soviet computer hacker named Linjas Torvaltos, and tries to warn other parents so that their children won't become hackers. The whole thing is worth reading it. It is still hilarious even after 20 years later. This has become a meme in the Linux community and there are copypasta versions of it. The Halloween Documents They are a series of leaked Microsoft documents released by Eric Raymond in 1998, close to October 21st. Hence the name. These documents contained information about how Microsoft was planning to deal with open source software on Linux, with these ones posing a threat to Microsoft's domination of the software industry. They were suggesting different practices to disrupt the progress of open source software. The authenticity of the documents has been discussed since they came out, but to be honest, I wouldn't really be surprised if they were actually real. It is known that Microsoft in that time really disliked Linux. Even the former CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, in 2001 said that Linux was, quote, a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. Temple OS Temple OS is an operating system designed by Terry Davis. It is heavily themed based on the Bible. He was schizophrenic and that led him to believe that he was communicating with God and that he told him that he needed to make an OS for gods through a temple, so he started to work on the project. Temple OS has a 64-bit architecture with a monolithic kernel. Other characteristics that it has is a 640 by 480 resolution and a 16-color display. All of this programmed with a variation of C named Holy C. It is a very interesting piece of software that achieves things like 3D models in the file explorer with just text files. That is impressive considering the limitations that he had. Sadly, Terry Davis was hit by a train in 2018, leading to his death. He had some videos that were deleted but that have been re-uploaded by other users where you can see his progress and you can also see that he had a very interesting relationship with Linux because he used it as his daily driver but considered Temple OS better than Unix systems. That is why it is in this iceberg. Not a lot to do with Linux, but people were begging me to include it, and I also think that it deserves a mention. Linus's behavior on mailing lists Aside from the Nvidia's middle finger incident, it is reported that Linus Torvalds could be a very rude person when people disagreed with him, especially when developers submitted patches that Linus believed that weren't up to his standards. In 2018, Linus took a break from his role of the maintainer of the kernel to learn how to behave better and apologized to everyone that he offended. One month later, he returned and decided to add a new code of conduct to stop developers from engaging in online abuse. Weird versions of Linux because everyone is free to modify and make their own versions of Linux, some people have made some unusual distros from funny to weird and creepy ones. I am going to mention just the most popular ones. Red Star OS is a distribution believed to be based on Fedora with the KDE Plasma desktop environment. It is made by the North Korean government 
and it is the only operating system allowed there, and only to certain select people. There are multiple customizations to make it look like Mac OS. Some of its components are closed source, so people suspect that maybe it tracks its users and sends the data to the government. The website that hosted the ISO image is not active, so you'll have to go to any other site if you want to try it out. So, Linux It is a distro with a very simple purpose. If you enter any incorrect command in the terminal, it will run sudo rmrf slash star, wiping all your data. A mock OS in 2020, when the pandemic started, a lot of streamers made the game Among Us really popular, so much that the phrase Among Us became a meme, and this has led to the creation of Among OS, a distro themed like the game with a lot of references. It even has a custom NeoFetch icon. Hannah Montana Linux this is a distro based on Kubuntu that has a Hannah Montana theme. That's basically it, but it is such a big meme that it is often mentioned in the Linux community. NSA's attempts to backdoor Linux It is a well-known fact that we are being spied on with our own tech. Windows is closed source and we all know that it spies its users. Android is open source, yes, but the Google Play services aren't, and most Android phones need them to function properly, so it wouldn't be a big surprise that they were tracking us with them. Same goes for Apple, that even when it says that they don't track us, we can't really be sure because iOS and macOS are closed source. This is when you start to wonder if Linux has some sort of backdoor for any government agency like the NSA. Well, it doesn't, because if it did, we would have already found out. But that doesn't mean that the NSA has in fact tried to backdoor the kernel. In this interview, Linus Torvalds is asked if the NSA has approached to him and asked him to backdoor the kernel. Just see how he replies. Yeah, so this question, have, have any of you been approached by the US for a backdoor? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh. Some say it was a joke, but others think it was real. Linus's father, Nils Torvalds, once asked the same thing, and he replied with the following. Almost posed the question when my oldest son was asked the same question, do, are there, has he been approached by the NSA uh, about backdoors? Then he said no, but at the same time he nodded, because then he was sort of in the legal free. He had given the right answer and everybody understood that NSA had approached them. Razor FS it is a journaling file system licensed under the UPL v2 license that was introduced to Linux in the version 2.4.1. One of the features it offered was tail packing, a scheme to reduce internal fragmentation. Why is this almost at the end of the iceberg? Because of its creator, Hans Razor. His wife obtained a temporary restraining order against Hans in December 2004, after he pushed her at the height of the divorce proceedings. She went missing on September 5, 2006, and later in October 10, 2006, Hans was arrested for ending with the life of his wife. Debian Founders End Ian Ashley Murdoch was an American software engineer born in April 28, 1973. He is well known in the open source community for being the founder of the Linux distribution Debian. On December 28, 2015, he started to post some very weird tweets where he said that he was going to commit, but then he stated that he was being harassed by some police officers. Later that day, he committed suicide due to asphyxiation caused by hanging himself with a vacuum cleaner electrical cord, but that is what the police believes that happened. To this day, this is a very weird and shocking news for the Linux community.
Well, this was all for today. If you made it this far, I really don't know how to thank you. You are helping my channel a lot. This video took me a long time to make, but I enjoyed it. If you'd like me to make any other tech-related icebook videos, let me know in the comment section. I've been thinking about making the Android iceberg or the Google iceberg in general. Some other option is the Apple or iPhone iceberg. Goodbye world, see you in the next one.